Our true pandemic now is a pandemic of coercion and compliance. Welcome to The Manipulation Check with Dr. Jeff Spence and Dr. Dan Smilek. They are just two academics with PhDs in psychology trying to make sense of the world. Come and listen to the conversation. Well, today we have a very special guest with us on the show, and uh, she is the famous and the fabulous Dr. Julie Panessi. Welcome, Julie. I don't know if either of those things. It sounds like a lot to live up to in both counts. <laughs> <laughs> Although I can tell you, uh, I know we're going to talk about this. I just came from Ottawa. But if I'm famous in some circles, it did help me out because I tried to get into Ottawa on uh, Sunday, I think it was, rolled down my window to ask somebody for help, and they happened to recognize me, so it helped to get through yeah, the traffic. That's, a, that's celebrity <laughs> status right there. Yeah, well, as long as there's a function to it, then I'm all right with that. <laughs> yeah, so Jeff, maybe you can give us a little bio of Julie, just so that our listeners, uh, Julie's famous, but just in case. Yeah. Yeah, it's, it's borderline, you know, needs an introduction, doesn't need an introduction, I think, at this point. So we'll, we'll, <laughs> we'll go with the introduction for now anyways. So she's currently the pandemic ethics scholar at the Democracy Fund. She's a former professor of ethics with research specialization in Aristotle's virtue ethics and a background in medical ethics at Huron College, which is affiliated with Western University. She's published in the areas of ancient philosophy, ethical theory, and applied ethics taught courses in history of philosophy, political philosophy, ethical theory, applied ethics, including healthcare ethics. With respect to her education, she received a PhD in ethics and ancient philosophy from Western University, formerly uh, University of Western Ontario. She has an MA or master's in bioethics from the Joint Center for Bioethics at the University of Toronto and a diploma in ethics from the Kennedy Institute of Ethics at Georgetown University. And as of today, holds the, the distinguished position of being the first ever guest on the Manipulation Check podcast. Woo! <laughs> you should have loved yeah, that. You may need right. to update your CV. As of that's today. right. Yeah. So I'll get I'll get on that first. <laughs> Julie, you were at the uh, trucker rally in Ottawa on on the last weekend, I would imagine. And I listened to the speech online. Mm -hmm. You gave a very powerful speech. Can you tell us something about the movement and your experience there? Because what I heard from Justin Trudeau is that it's a bunch of fringe people who have racist flags and um, not good behavior. It's a very good question. So I was in Ottawa from Sunday until Wednesday, Tuesday. Tuesday. So th sort of three days uh, in total. And while I was there, I did a lot of things. Um, so I, yeah, I, sp I spoke uh, to the uh, sort of the crowd that had gathered on Parliament Hill. Uh, I walked around, did some interviews, um, just walked around and talked to people, whether it was the truckers themselves, the people that were supporting them, the people who had come to Ottawa from really literally far and wide, um, and just got, I mean, I walked, I think, from east to west, the the bulk of, like, the, the main part of the protest, right? Trucks are they're kind of concentric circles, right? So I didn't, I'm sure I didn't, I'm sure I did not see every part of Ottawa that's occupied by trucks, but I certainly walked a lot of it, um, both east and west of the canal. And then it goes north up to the parliament buildings and then about five or six blocks south of that. So I was really, you know, physically, geographically um, saw an awful lot of it. And there is you know, people's perspectives are very different, and I, I realize that. There are some interesting, a lot of interesting literature and philosophy, as I'm sure you know, about the challenges with perception and the differences between appearance and reality. But while I was there seeing it on the ground, simultaneously watching mainstream media coverage and uh, like the press conference that uh, the prime minister's office gave on Monday, it was like... Um, you know, uh, two parallel mm. universes. What's being reported is nothing like what's being there. And and one of the things that punctuated that for me is on Monday, about the middle of the day, uh, I was up on the stage giving a speech and you're up on a, on a truck mm. itself. So you're elevated enough that you can see about two blocks on either side. 
of you. And you have to turn to one side, talk a little bit, turn the other side, talk a little bit. So my point is you can see a lot of the crowd. Um, there were thousands of people there that day on Monday even, um, and not one mainstream media outlet that I could see. Mm. So you have, in my view, and we can talk about this in a bit, a very peaceful protest that's anomalous. I mean, it's historically unprecedented that has attracted crowds that range from, you know, probably 3,000 and Saturday, I think the estimates were up to tens of thousands, right, of people. Um, and CBC, CTV, Global didn't think it was worth uh, even covering it, really. And what was also interesting is when you see the images that the mainstream media has chosen to cover when they do cover something, um, you can see where they get them because, you know, as with any crowd, there's a spectrum of, um, of individuals and what they're doing and what they're wearing and what they're saying and what kind of flags they're carrying. Um, and mainstream media has picked up very clearly on, you know, the most contentious, most sort of extreme looking people, um, the whitest people, mm. to be quite honest, and the most sort of graphic and possibly offensive slogans and flags. And what I saw when I was there is a very large group, a very diverse group uh, I talked to a lot of people of color, um, people, uh, East Asians and um, Southeast Asians and uh, Blacks, um, people of very different ages. When I was just about to leave, uh, I ran into two couples. So they were truckers, uh, two couples, and they had just met each other. Um, and one couple was from Quebec and they hardly spoke English. And the other couple was I don't know where they were from, but they were they they only spoke English and hardly could, could hardly understand French. And these two couples had had developed this lovely friendship over the last few days, and they were probably in their seventies, mm. right? So, and then I saw people with their families there, and they had babies on their you know carrying their babies, and they had their dogs with them. So, I mean, running the gamut age wise, um, and I've never seen so many people. Uh, you know, hugging, patting each other on the back, shaking hands, happy to see each other, um, like just such a, and <laughs> you know when something really hits you emotionally and you get kind of chills on the back of your neck or your head and then uh, running throughout your body. I mean, I had that many times wow. a day, every time I was there. And I don't think that was a unique experience. And it was so uh, beautiful to see people who just perfect strangers to each other and and under other circumstances never would have met because they're you know geographically different or they come from such different walks of life. But here they're brought together. I mean, I was, you know, there were some scientists that I know there um, who have PhDs in immunology, virology, uh, pathology, things like that. And there's, you know, they're shaking hands with some of the truckers that drove uh, in the main convoy from the West. You know, I mean, if nothing else, this has accomplished this incredible sort of bridging of different walks of life, different different people from different places. And it's really, I mean, I was going to say I, I'm speechless, but I'm clearly not <laughs> speechless. It's really, it's, it really inspired a lot of awe. And I think what I would, you know, if people are listening and they're kind of wondering, like, what's going on there? Um try to get there yourself mm -hmm. and see. And I think you'll see a, a, a radically different picture than what um, our media and government is telling us is going on. Don't, don't take my word for it. You'll go there. As soon as you get on the ground, you'll see you're not, um, there's, there isn't really much reason to be worried for your safety as of Tuesday when I left. I mean, this is a quickly evolving situation. We have to be a bit cautious. We don't know uh, how the police, the RCMP, the government is going to respond. Um, it's changing on a daily basis. But at the time I was there, it was peaceful. It was beautiful. It was lovely. I've never seen such uh, an incredible expression of um, Canadian, what I take to be fundamental Canadian values. And um, it's beautiful. Did you see much change from day to day as you were there, as it was... No, I mean, I wasn't there Saturday, so mm -hmm. I missed that sort of initial punctuated um, 
in you know excitement but it was st- i found that there was quite a bit of that uh even on sunday monday tuesday still i was out walking around the streets on tuesday and people were i mean these truckers are sleeping i don't know if people are realizing this but they're sleeping in their trucks um the washrooms to most of the pu- uh, public buildings have been locked so they can't get in um, porta potties are being brought in to to try to address that. But these are people who, I mean, depending on where they left from, have been sleeping, you know, in their trucks and and getting along that way for ten days, something like that. Um, and uh, one, I, I was out there. I did an interview. Um, and I had to hold my phone up. This was Tuesday morning. And it was about 30 seconds before you could feel like, just like, you know, little knives hitting your, I mean, it was so cold. We don't have, where, where I live, we don't have that kind of cold very often. Um, but they're just incredibly resilient and positive in spite of all of that. And they were out shoveling. There was a lot of kind of slush that had packed down and formed slippery. So they were out shoveling so people didn't slip when they were walking by. And the truckers had put um, garbage bags up on the fence posts so they could, you know, tidy up from all these crowds. I mean, that's what I saw. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So mm-hmm. you, you've become somewhat of the, the voice around the ethics of the vaccine mandates. Um, can you tell us a little bit about how that happened? <laughs> yes, by not by design. You I didn't can tell plan you that. This. I mean, like, <laughs> no goodness, could a person have? Mm-hmm. I can't. If if a person could have, you'd have to be a lot more I think, intelligent and media savvy than I was. Um, I mean, I think I think what what initiated that is that I made this video in September that that went I saw viral, that, which is still kind yeah. of. Yeah. Did you? I mean, it's still really astounding to me because like, say you went into your doctor's office and maybe you have a heart condition and your doctor says, well, there are different ways of treating this. You know, we can give you a course of this medication or you can do surgery, but the surgery has these ben- possible benefits and these possible risks. And you said, you know, I've thought about it and I don't really like the look of those risks. So I don't really feel like I need the surgery anyway. So I think I'm going to decline. Well, if you recorded a video about that, it's never going to go viral. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And that's just a typical example of engaging, a, 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 you know, a mature, most days, <laughs> mature, rational adult, uh, you know, trying to perform an act of informed consent. That's not the kind of thing that should be so anomalous or so controversial uh, that it goes viral around the world. But that was, I guess, the first step, the first thing that initiated it. Um, and then... You know, I start interview requests came in and the nice thing about that, I mean, two nice things. One is it gave me the chance to talk to really interesting people like you guys and develop new relationships and flesh out these issues in different ways. Mm-hmm. And um, and it also, you know, because I'm doing interviews often every day, um, it's giving me the chance to run things over in my mind constantly You know, and you're always wondering, like, am I right about this? Am I wrong about this? Have I missed something? Have things changed such that I should pivot or uh, change my position? And and sure, I mean, there have been, um, you know, some points about which I've sort of amended my position. But overall... Uh, it's remained pretty consistent. And then I got the position with the Democracy Fund, and then that gave me a bit more uh, of a platform to to do, you know, more interviews and speeches and things like that. And then I wrote a book. And then I guess things just kind of build exponentially for, from there. But I'm sure the video was really the, if I hadn't recorded that, we wouldn't mm. be talking today. Yeah, I saw that video. And uh, I it was around the time that some colleagues from Wilfrid Laurier and I wrote an open letter to our presidents of our university. So I'm at the University of Waterloo and uh, that one mm-hmm. kind of hit the media a little bit. And, you know, you get all this negative feedback, but you also get some positive feedback. And then when your video, you know, I, it was all kind of in the mix and I found it very encouraging, actually, the stand mm-hmm. that you took um, and the decisiveness of your stand. Uh, so it was it was very powerful uh, for me. So, so ha- as you've mm-hmm. thought about this, what do you now see as the main differences in the ethical perspectives between those who are pro-mandatory vaccination and those who are anti-mandatory vaccination or for freedom? <laughs> yeah, yeah, good, good question. Um, I think about this question a lot, maybe, maybe more than anything else, because 
whenever there is some kind of debate between people, it's often most effective if you can figure out, well, what are the things that we at least agree about? And, and then, you know, maybe we can get some traction with that agreement. And often that resolves some of the disagreement because, right, what we might disagree about are the implications of our core beliefs. But once we understand that our core beliefs are really the same, then the differences between those implications gets resolved, right? So I think this is a really important question. And I'm glad you phrased it in the terms of mandates, right? So I think the debate now is or should be about whether or not vaccination or any of these COVID restrictions should be mandated on people, right? Um, About a month ago, it occurred to me, it probably should have occurred to me earlier than that, but um, it occurred to me to say very clearly that, you know, vaccination is a medical choice. Uh, Implementing mandates and abiding by them is a political choice. So what we're talking about here really in my mind is a political issue. So what is the difference, if I just rephrase your question a little bit, then what is the difference between people who think that it's politically legitimate or or maybe necessary to enforce vaccine mandates and people who feel that that's not legitimate within a democratic nation like Canada, right? Yeah. So the people who are on the pro-mandate side... um, I mean, it's very hard, hard, hard to know what's in their mind. But I think what you see from surveying the language is that there is there's there are two parts to this. Right. There's a collectivist group mentality piece or part. And then there's a harm safety part. Right. So the um, the narrative, the language of those who defend the mandate is that, well, our primary moral obligation is to the group, not to individuals. And how do we flesh that out in terms of what that obligation to the group looks like? Well, it's in terms of minimizing harm, maybe producing benefit, although I don't think that's how we're seeing the concern getting fleshed out quite as much. It's about mitigating Mm -hmm. harm. So that's very much um, um, a collectivist, I think, bordering on utilitarian strategy. So I think that the the pro-mandate people are utilitarians of some form, even if they don't sort of recognize that, Mm -hmm. right? And then the people who um, think there's a problem politically with the vaccine mandates tend to be more um, focused on freedom. And that language looks more individualistic, right? So it's more focused on the rights that we recognize and try to protect in order to secure this sphere Um, the broadest sphere possible of free action for a mature rational agent. And that's a very hard debate because the fundamental terms are either very difficult to resolve or intractable. Mm -hmm. And moral philosophy um, has has run through this debate for at least um, 200 years, dating back to... um, you know, that maybe 300 years dating back to sort of the debate between Immanuel Kant, the deontologists on the one hand, and then um, Bentham and Mill, the utilitarians on the other hand. But really, it goes back more like two millennia to the, to the ancient philosophers, where they're trying to decide whether or not the hedonists are right and pleasure is the ultimate goal, or someone like, uh, you know, Plato and Aristotle, where virtue and self-reliance and controlling what you can control, if that's the goal, right? Um, What's very interesting, I think, about this trucker movement is that they are all being very clear that they're fighting for everyone's freedom, right? They're not anti-vaccine. They're anti-mandate that starts to restrict that sphere of freedom for the individual. So I think one of the reasons why it's it's so popular and it's gaining so much traction is that people see that they're trying to be unifying and inclusive, right? And it's very interesting. One of the main truckers, um, Chris, um, you know, he I did a podcast with Trish Woods and he and Tamara were on and I was on and he he wanted to say I think I think Trish asked him you know what would you want to say to our prime minister and he holds up his vaccine card and says what I want to say to you is I'm fully vaccinated. I can do whatever I want. I can drive to the States. I can keep my job. I can, you know, I'm complying with you, Um, but I'm not doing it to comply with you. I'm doing it because that's my personal medical choice. I'm part of the convoy 
because I don't think that should be for, you know, mandated for Canadians in a democracy. It's interesting to hear you talk about the, the politi- the introduction of the political to the medical. And I'm, I was, I'm wondering if there's even another phase to this that helps with, with muddying and the confusion and the complexity of it is that there's been this economic, uh, in, injection as well in that you're, you're, you're dealing with employers who are doing these mandates. So now there's a sort of financial economic exchange relationship as well that's happening. And I know historically economics was rooted in basically moral philosophy and has changed recently or of, of the past several decades, let's say it's a little bit more physics based, but I was, I was wondering if the economic, the, the, the morality involved in maybe economic exchange is also implicated in some of these in some of these discussions, but hasn't been talked about, or if it has been talked about, maybe I haven't haven't heard it. I was wondering if you had any comments on that. Yeah, really good point. I mean, I think the economic dimension of this has been discussed in terms of um, you know regulatory capture and conflicts of interest between the main financial stakeholders, like the big pharmaceutical companies, um, and their positioning with respect to. Um, governance agencies like the FDA and Health Canada and things like that. So we think we've had that discussion. But one thing I worry about, especially when it comes to how these economic considerations are affecting the individual, is that when you are, um, when you know that you're going to lose your job if you don't take a vaccine, now all of a sudden, and if you don't have your own, if you wouldn't take the vaccine otherwise, right, if you're doing it only to keep your job, only to maintain your livelihood, only to put food on the table for your family. Now your reason for submitting to a medical intervention is not for the intrinsic benefits that it's going to afford you or others, but for extrinsic financial reasons. So now we are financially incentivizing medical choices. Right. Wow. And we've seen this, right? We've seen this in other contexts. I mean, we in the fertility context, we talk about the harms of commodifying embryos, turning human life into, um, you know, into a monetary product. The fertility industry, there's a big you know, this is a big challenge to to prevent that from happening, the, the buying and selling of human reproductive parts. And then when it comes to human trafficking, I mean, there we know the harms that can come from motivating people to make healthcare choices on the basis of money alone. Um, I think the other thing that's interesting and harmful and worrisome is how conspicuous this medical choice has become, right? So the thing that's always been so, in my mind anyway, that's been so important to providing high quality health care is that the, the, the relationship of trust or what we call the fiduciary relationship between patients and their doctor or their primary health care provider, whoever that is, um, that 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 bond is protected against all costs. And that's important, right? So patients can feel that they can reveal information to their doctor and it will be protected, it will be private. And if they don't feel that, then they might hold information back that's actually quite relevant to providing them good care. So protecting that that intimate private bond between a patient and his or her uh, primary healthcare provider is crucial. And now we're seeing people um, not only, right, it's not only that they're getting the COVID vaccines outside of the context of that relationship because they're just going to whatever clinic or the Air Canada Centre and standing in a line, but they're broadcasting the fact that they're doing that on social media. I haven't seen them as much lately, but, you know, we had those, like, you know, I got my vaccine stickers and there are walls kind of like what, you're going to the Oscars or something and you've got this wall behind you that says you're at, you know, you're getting your vaccine. So I think what we've really, we've taken this medical choice and this is, I think, I think, I mean, maybe you can think of another example, but I think it's unprecedented in the history of medicine that on this scale, we would have taken medical choices and medical procedures out of the context of the doctor's office and just stuck it right in the public sphere for all to see and all to comment Mm -hmm. on. Yeah. Yeah. Like the idea of personal medical information and not disclosing 
that seems like this kind of dusty, antiquated idea. And yeah, it seems like, this, like somebody yeah. you hear somebody talk about that. And you're like, it's like somebody's talking about heating their house with coal or something. You're like, what are you talking like? That's. Yes. And people who want to preserve that are treated as though they're trying that, you know, they're, they feel like they're entitled right. or they're trying to, you know, it's really just, I mean, the language I'm seeing now is that um, trying to protect your personal medical information is just a sign of your own okay. privilege. And selfishness too, that you're somehow selfish. Right. And yeah. Selfish. <clears throat> yeah, that's really interesting. Right? And that's really interesting. And what's, so without even commenting like normatively on whether mm. that's good or bad, um, what's interesting about that, I think, is that privilege is um, is like inherently a stratifying notion, right? You can only have privilege if you have more than something better than someone else, right? Um, not everyone in the world can have the same privileges because then you, the, the notion becomes empty or vacuous, right? So um, this, I mean, I think, you know, in ethics and, and in, in medical ethics for a long time, we've worked very hard to try to create a kind of equity among people that does um, reduce the effects of privilege, right? But um, as soon as we make, like as soon as we create a stratified society and, and we add that conspicuous element to it and we say, we, oh, now we have vaccinated and unvaccinated people. Now we have compliant people and non-compliant people. Now we have people who want to crazily exercise their rights and people who don't feel the need to. As soon as we you know, introduce that kind of language, um, it becomes very accusatory. Yeah. Right? And... I can't help but think that one of the problems, right, with thinking that, or one of the problems with accusing someone who is standing up for freedom and their right to make their own autonomous medical choices and calling that privilege is that it makes people feel as though it's wrong to make your own choices. But autonomy is really, autonomy or, or self-determination, right, or the right to make choices for ourselves, um, it's not a luxury. It's not a thing for the haves and not the have not, you know, it's intimately connected to who we are as people. I want to jump, I'll jump in there. Right? It's a personal identity issue, just a, right? Can I, I want to jump in there with an exclamation point on what you just said, because in your book, I noticed you reference a, a, um, uh, a, a paper on the ethics of vaccine refusal by Michael Ko Koalik, Koalik, I'm not sure how to say it right. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. one of the things he makes the case for is that the, that that idea is fundamental to what makes human, one of the things that makes human life worth living. And I thought that was a very, that's a very important yeah. point to emphasize when, when talking about some of these things that, that idea of autonomy and bodily yeah. autonomy specifically, it's fundamental to what makes human life worth living. And that's not something that ever gets, brought up i don't think in these kind in these kinds of discussions i think that's right and i think um a couple of points on that one is um another point um mccowlick makes in the article that you're talking about is that the people on the pro mandate side want to say well the reason why people everyone should get vaccinated is because if they don't then they pose a health risk to others so there's this like risk of harm to others um i don't think the science is showing that that position is well supported anymore but sort of leaving the science aside for a minute let's say for the sake of argument for the sake of argument that remaining unvaccinated does pose a risk of harm to others. Kowalik says that even if that's true, getting vaccinated against your will constitutes an actual yeah. harm. Yeah. It's not There's a no risk, risk of yeah. harm. It's an actual harm because you've lost your autonomy. And I imagine, you know, people might say, well, why is that such a big deal? I mean, if you're sick or dead, why does it matter if you're autonomous? And I think some people might say to that, that they would rather live freely than live a long life. They'd rather live freely than live a life that's better according to some objective measure or according to someone else. Um, I don't know if you're familiar with the book uh, Nudge mm -hmm. by Cass Sunstein. And yeah, and so there's been a lot of 
speculation about this nudge unit that's part of the Privy Council and Teresa Tam has has talked about this and has defended it. And she has said things like, well, we know a lot of people want to get vaccinated anyway, so we just give them a little push in various various ways. And she thinks yeah, well, it's not a push, a nudge, so you don't notice it, right? <laughs> Yeah, yeah, that's Although right. They are Subtle, pushing now. Yes, it's it's just pretty noticeable now. It's like you do you lose your job unless you take the vaccine. It's not, you're not nudging anybody. <laughs> that is, it, yeah, that's right. Nudge to push, fine line. Um, but one of the things that Sunstein, the, the the argument he makes is that well, the reason why nudges are ethically defensible is because people are not always the best judge of what's best for them. And I guess to that I would say. No doubt. Sure. Yeah. <laughs> right. I'm sure that like, you know, there are many instances in our lives where someone else could have made the decision better. Um, we are tired sometimes. We err in our judgment. We have, you know, we miss things. Um, and some of us are self-destructive. Sure. I grant all of that. Um, but I still think there's value in being able to be the author of your own life, even if you make mistakes. Yeah. Right. And I think a lot of people feel that it's, yeah, go I was ahead. just going to say that the others, whoever is supposed to be better at making these decisions, they also err. So they've got weaknesses as well. And if yeah. it's the group making the decisions, well, committees err all the time. We know there are all these group dynamics that unfold. Uh, quite possibly more than mm -hmm. individuals, because there's a lot of literatures that suggest that when you have that group mentality, um, you often, the, the resultant decision is usually something yeah. in the middle, right? And it's not clear that that sort of, um, that, that middle of the line decision is the best one. It's just the one that, I think we see this in politics a lot. So you have two candidates who are often the best, and then you have a weak third come up the middle because it's the one that everyone can agree about. I think we've seen that very mm -hmm. recently um, in federal politics. A and any anyway, to that point of yours, that um, it's not clear that another individual can make a decision for our lives that's better. It's not clear that a group um, like a government can, can make a decision for us that's better. And I'm not sure it's even a matter of better mm -hmm. because, um, you know, for one thing, the individual him or herself is presumably the best competent judge about um, what decision is going to best fit within that set of deeply held beliefs and values that makes us who we are, that defines our identity, mm -hmm. right? And why in the world would we want to think that someone else could make that decision better? And even if they don't, if we imagine the person, the most self-destructive person who makes objectively the worst decisions about his or her life, and then if we take away the ability for that person to make any decisions, what in what sense are they left with a life? Right. Mm -hmm. you know? That's a very good point. Julie, I want to... I'm on the side of autonomy, you can tell. Yeah, yeah for sure. <laughs> yeah. Um, I want to just bring this uh, more into psychology a little bit. I know you're a philosopher and we're, we're psychology researchers. Um, and in psychology, people look at moral judgments using you know, various paradigms. One of them is using these sacrifice scenarios. And uh, the basic idea mm -hmm. of these sacrifice scenarios is that you have to make a choice to harm one person who is not in harm's way to save a group of people who are in harm's way and, and are in imminent danger, right? And so the, there's this trolley scenario mm -hmm. that's the very common uh, example, and I think we use it in, in the last uh, episode. Mm -hmm. So I want to give you guys a slightly different one, just as an example this one's very relevant. In some of the work, uh, very popular work by Green and colleagues, they use a vaccine test scenario. Okay, listen to this. <clears throat> a viral epidemic has spread across the globe, killing millions of people. You have developed two substances in your home laboratory. You know that one of them is a vaccine, but you don't know which one. You also know that the other one is deadly. Once you figure out which substance is the vaccine, you can use it to save millions of lives. You have with you two people who are under your care, and the only way to identify the vaccine is to inject each of these people with one of the two substances. One person will live, the other will die, and you'll be able to start saving lives with your vaccine. Is it appropriate for you to kill one of these people with a deadly injection in order to identify a vaccine that will save millions of lives. So <laughs> that's 
the kind of scenario. So you're pitting, you know, harming one person against a group. How many people do you think this study was done in 2008? How many people do you think would have said it's okay to harm the one person to develop a vaccine to save the many? This is so interesting because you, so I don't know anything about this study or this particular thought experiment. So I would just purely be yeah, guessing, sure. uh, but you mentioned the trolley yeah. problem initially. Uh, and I remember when Philippa Foote was writing about that and she was writing about why it is that people, um, so the two versions of that problem, right? Just in case uh, some of your viewers aren't, uh, don't have it at the, on the tip of your brain, right? Um, in one scenario, you come across a, 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 tr a trolley barreling down a track and there are five people on the track there's one person tied to another track there's a lever you can pull a lever you can divert the trolley and kill one to save five and then in a second iteration of that problem now um, you have the option to push one fat man according to the um, thought experiment onto the track uh, killing that one man in order to save five and Philippa Foote says that well um, the vast majority of people would uh, support pulling the lever but not pushing the fat man and That's, I don't know if you guys remember I think it was something like 90 percent of people would not push the fat man. yeah so it, it's it's like the results are strikingly yeah so people have done the, the the research on that because I guess this originated in philosophy actually um, but uh, yeah they yeah. they so if you're just pushing the lever, 80 to 85% of the people will do it. And I don't have the data for the other one, but I remember it, it is like only 13%. I think it was yeah, 90. Won't, only 13% yeah. will do it. About 90% won't do it. Won't push the man in front of the trolley. So, so basically everybody, I mean, most of the people who would pull the lever would not push the fat yeah. man. Which is because that generated a lot of discussion in the ethical literature. Because, like, well, hold on a minute here. If all that matters is people dead or alive at the end mm -hmm. of the day, if you really are consequentialists, then your answer should be the same to both. It isn't. So, what's going on? Right. So then Foote said, well, what's going on is that we think we have this intuition that it's worse to intentionally harm someone than it is to let them die. So it's worse to be responsible for pushing the fat man than it is to, um, you know, there's there's this thinking that pulling the lever is not an in, like a direct intentional action in the way that pushing the fat man is. Right. And then there was really interesting neuropsychological literature out of um uh, Josh, uh, Jonathan Green, Josh, yeah, Green, Jonathan yeah. Green, I think from mm -hmm. Harvard Green, do you know? And he said that like, yeah, there, there are neuro uh, psychological correlates and we put people in and, and MRI and I'm, MRI machines and and yeah the different parts of the brain light up right so um so to your question in 2008 what were people saying I don't know but my guess is the numbers don't look the same because we have very different views right about to what we're responsible so I would say the numbers are going to look more like 80 90 percent would say you should test the vaccines on the poor innocent people and see which one is safe 79 percent so up. you're you're right. Say that you should harm the individual to develop a vaccine, to identify a vaccine that you can save millions of people. So that's yeah, that's huge. And just a, oh, and by the way, that's not a thought experiment because that's what we're doing. Well, th this is the interesting <laughs> right? thing. I, I, I thought this is exactly related to what we're doing. And I guess the way people talk about this yeah. in the literature is that you have, if you're choosing to harm the one person to save the many. That would be a utilitarian type choice, or that would maybe be a collectivist type choice. And if you're choosing yeah. to not harm the individual and just allow the others to to perish, um, that's at, one one word that people use is deontological. Um, that somehow you're working from this fundamental rule that you have that you shouldn't engage in actions that harm innocent people. But you're the philosopher. Am I getting this close right? <laughs> Yeah, I mean, de deontology is really, um, it's a very complex s group of people because it depends who you mean by a deontologist. If you mean Immanuel Kant, he was very hard-lined and there are certain uh, actions you're obligated to do and those that you have an obligation or a rule not to do regardless. So he has this famous, you know, example of, well, what if there's a Nazi knocking at the door asking if you're harboring, a, you know, a Jewish person and what would you do? Or, you know, someone, what would you do? This, that's come out in the literature, right? Not in Kant itself, but it's come out in the literature. And um, But deontologists, um, 
um, more contemporary ones often build exceptions or rules into their deontology that makes them look a lot more like utilitarians, Mm, but utilitarians do the same Mm -hmm. thing. So now utilitarians and deontologists are a lot closer to each other, I think, because they've each built the opposing ethos into their system. So a lot of ethicists, if you meet them, you'll say, oh, are you a utilitarian or a deontologist? And they'll say, well, (laughs) (laughs) Let me explain. <laughs> Seriously. I see. You know. And then, and then it, um, you let them talk long enough and then you're able to figure out which ilk they are. Mm-hmm. Right. So um, anyway, what was the question? I forgot. Yeah, well, it was, it was just your, your thoughts about utilitarianism versus if, if, if those concepts characterize the situation properly. Yeah. Um, and it, it's very interesting because reading the green stuff, particularly, you get the sense that they, they favor utilitarianism because they try to argue based on neural data and their interpretation of the data that the utilitarian mm-hmm. decision requires cognitive resources to make and that the non-utilitarian decision is much more emotional and rapid. Yeah, Emotive. so it's like That's kind of a lower number, level, yeah. right? So you get this intelligent decision to be utilitarian and then you have this lower level one. Um, and of course, people have challenged that, uh, but it's very interesting that it, it seems like there's this value placed on utilitarianism mm-hmm. even in the, in, in the initial part of the field. I didn't know that. What I remembered, and I don't remember the part of the brain. Is it prefrontal yeah, cortex? Yeah, it's a, it's a part of the pre- prefrontal cortex, to, yeah. That the fat man taps into? Yeah, there, there's Is several the different thinking? parts of the prefrontal cortex, and depending on what's going on, different parts are involved, yeah. It's, it's a pretty complicated network. I, yeah, I guess I haven't... I haven't seen a literature that sort of um, disparages that, that, you know... Um, involving that part of the brain in a moral decision. What I what I do remember in the in the Philip of Foot and Joshua Green sort of literature is that um, the reason why that part of the brain is engaged in the fat man iteration of the trolley problem is because you are up close and yeah. personal to this human mm-hmm. being so that you're seeing and feeling and it's in your face the true human costs of what you're about to do. And I think that's really important. I mean, if if I've got that right, you know, if I'm remembering that literature right, I think that's really important because one of the troubles, I think, with, with con- the consequentialist aspect of utilitarianism is that the people who don't make it in the calculus, right? So the people who are just like supposedly justifiably mm-hmm. sacrificed, as you say, in order to save the group, um, they're, it's not that they're given zero value in that utilitarian calculus. But as soon as the decision is made for the group and not for the individual, then they have no value anymore at all. Like there is no value to their humanness. There's no value to connecting. There's no value in regretting that you've made a decision that harms them Mm -hmm. on the utilitarian scheme. So it, it worries me greatly. And I think we see this in the language Yes, in like medical ethics literature about this collectivist mentality, thinking about vaccine mandates, but also more kind of colloquially, you know, in social media and just in conversations between people, they're very um, dismissive of the harms that are done to the minority for the sake of doing good for the majority, even if that like arguing that that's what we're doing, right? Um, and I worry about the costs um, to our characters of being so callous in that way. Yeah. You know, you would at least hope that if if you are causing harm to anyone for any reason, even if it's justifiable objectively or you think it's justifiable, you would at least hope there would be an element of what we often call moral regret. Like, like this kind of residue that's left over, like a remainder, right? We think, well, I made the right decision, but I wish I didn't have to make that. I wish I, I wish we lived in a better world where that decision wasn't, yeah. you know, um, demanded. Well, you know, me. and I don't see that as part of the narrative. Yeah, right? there, well, there, there are some interesting work on the individual differences of people who make these utilitarian choices versus who people who make the other choice and. It's kind of uh, maybe a little. Hmm, tell me yeah, about that. I don't it's a little know frightening. That. So utilitarian judgments tend to increase as um, a person's empathy for individuals decreases, as their empathy for groups increases. So there's an interest. It's not just empathy, right? It's em- empathy for individual versus empathy for a group. And there's this interesting literature on attachment right. styles that if you have anxious attachment styles, you're more much more likely to feel empathy for the group than you are for the individual. 
Um, utilitarian judgments mm. increase with psychopathy. Um, so those are people who show low empathy, callousness, right. yeah, <laughs> thrill seeking. Um, uh, it increases with people who show traits of Mach Machiavellianism. So that's being manipulative, emotionally detached, cynical. People mm -hmm. who have low meaning in life. I'm um, just looking at the list here. Lower sense of responsibility, increased anger, lower levels of serotonin. And, you know, serotonin is, is kind of thought to be kind of like a more happy neurotransmitter. There's, that's not, you know, that's a very uh, simplification, a huge simplification. But yeah. And you tend to make more utilitarian judgments when you're drunk, when you're inebriated. <laughs> It's very interesting. The whole whole world is drunk. Is that what you're saying? Our, our our public health officers are drunk. Could be. I mean, at least that would be some sort of reasonable explanation that we could have some degree of sympathy for. Yeah, but uh, there's a lot. There are these what I would say are negative traits that seem to load on to making utilitarian responses. What I found frightening is that already in the vaccine scenario in 2008, you know, uh, 80 percent of the people, 79 percent of the people would actually make the utilitarian choice so our society was completely prepared in some sense mm -hmm. and maybe even more so by the by this pandemic to go to go with full-blown utilitarianism that's so interesting i mean one question that pops up for me as you're saying all of this is which comes first right i mean <clears throat> is there some reason to explain why we have that negative set of traits that you mentioned, psychopathy, Machiavellianism, um, you know, empathy for the group, not in all of that? Did that develop first and then it was natural for people with those traits to pick utilitarianism over something else, right? Or is it that for some reason we're naturally drawn to the utilitarian way of thinking and then an outgrowth of that is that we would have these other kind of... Um, psychopathic uh or borderline psychopathic traits right is there a priority to those um so we've got the sort of the psychological traits on the one hand and then the moral disposition on the other hand is there did one of those develop initially and if so why and then you know why is the other one an outgrowth of that that's just fascinating yeah it's like a chicken egg i didn't know that yeah. but it doesn't surprise me mm -hmm. i think it has to be um I mean, utilitarianism is a lot easier for a psychopath than a non-psychopath because some of the harms that utilitarianism may require you to do, um, for lack of a better way to put it, should exert a pretty hefty burden on your conscience. Hefty conscience burdens are not easy to live with, and so we probably avoid them unless we have a certain degree of detachment from empathy for others right yeah i find uh, m that maybe the issue of attachment style is a key one and that has to do with the way that we're raised right with our parents and so on so if you have this anxious attachment style there's some nuance yeah. there you tend much more to side with the group because you look to the group for all sorts of positive psychological benefits and so that itself might mm -hmm. then make you behave in all sorts of these negative ways almost like psychopathically low um, and with low empathy towards the individual because you're always fi focused on the group. So maybe there's some societal thing like that going on. But I mean, it's all it's all speculation at, mm -hmm. at this point, I guess. One thing I have to offer, um, it's not not decisive in any way. It's anecdotal. But I have found that the people who tend to uh, adopt this utilitarian way of thinking tend to be raised um, in a more group you know, unsurprisingly, in a more kind of group dynamic, and that people who hold more deontological views tend to have come from a more nuclear family, not in preschool, daycare, raised at home, you know. Um, so it's, it would be interesting if there was some literature, some studies that track, wow, yeah. you know, upbringing uh, as, a, um, as a predictor for these kinds of um, character traits on the one hand, and then uh, moral disposition. On That's the interesting. Hand, you know? There's even some research that yeah. shows to kind of maybe potentially add to the, the chicken egg issue or maybe illuminate a little bit. Mm -hmm. There's some research that shows that people who make utilitarian judgments with respect to life and death are trusted less by others. By others because they've gotten wind of your utilitarianism. So it's, yeah. You, so if you're more I utilitarian, so. you're going to be less <laughs> perceived as less trustworthy. Which may speak to this underlying yeah, about, tendency to maybe not have that as a 
as a default position. It doesn't say anything about who the sample was necessarily, but. Yeah. Well, that makes a lot of sense though, right? Because utilitarians are not committed people to anything other than utilitarianism. Right. I mean, there's no, um, there's no room in the utilitarian system to protect this particular personal right. relationship at all costs. You're always going to sacrifice it. You're always going to, um, sacrifice one of the members of the group if it if it if it's better for the group there's no reason if you know someone is a utilitarian why would you ever trust that person with your personal information with your life with your mm -hmm. child's life you you it would be irrational to do so whereas if you are a non-utilitarian you can have um, an untrumpable commitment to X, Y, or Z, whatever that is, right? An untrumpable commitment to protect this person, come what may. An untrumpable commitment never to lie, come what may. But um, uh, utilitarianism is, I don't know if fluid is the right word, but it's fluid, is it transient. Your, your, your target is whatever will produce the most good. So you have no commitment. Right, like how... That, right? I don't know if the, this this gets discussed, but sort of how how much recognition is given to sort of like post hoc possibilities, or like how hackable utilitarian is. But you can push aside harms, ignore them, or reframe things as har that aren't harms. You can, you can maybe selectively choose, even playing around with the the time scale, like pushing things out and the, having things be more immediate versus pushing pushing things out in the future. I think that's one of the things that's been brought up particularly yeah. by the convoy and people who are going to be pro-freedom is that people say they're doing a lot of things for their kids, for the next generation. So they're, you can almost reframe this principled perspective as being more utilitarian, but having a more future-oriented focus versus the more immediate. So yeah. harms and benefits start and stop within this time frame, and this is what we're considering. But when you can start considering outside of that, things get a little bit murkier, and you can kind of maybe pick and choose all these parameters and all these things to focus on is that yeah the um i mean utilitarianism does kind of have um built into it a way to okay. deal with this which is the distinction between act utilitarianism and mm. rule utilitarianism so what the utilitarians will often say is that well and i talked earlier about how utilitarianism can sometimes look a right. lot more like deontology if you build enough principles into it so the more uh rules the utilitarian adopts the more deontological it can look like so an example would be um something like well while um Technically, as a utilitarian, I can always trump someone's right to bodily autonomy. Maybe we've decided and assessed the situation and decided that when we do that too much, ultimately, in the long term, um, that sacrifice of individual autonomy does not produce the greatest good, does not, because people are always feeling uncertain about their lives and they can't make decisions that have, you know, that matter and things like that. So a rule utilitarian might say, okay, well, what we'll do is we'll build this rule into the system and say that um, as a moral agent, I'm obligated always to um, engage in the action that produces the greatest amount of happiness for the greatest number, unless it violates mm. personal autonomy. So, and it doesn't matter what your rule is, you know, but the rule that's chosen, very interestingly, often becomes a rights-based rule in order to recognize the fact that when we minimize rights too much, we also lose happiness, collective happiness. So... So it's a complicated... Yeah, so our, our Charter of Rights and Freedoms is essentially something like that, where you maybe have a utilitarian yeah. frame, everybody tries to benefit the greatest good with some specifications mm -hmm. that you have, you can't violate these basic rights. But right now we've sort of chucked that out the window and are just going full bore utilitarian in a very focused way. <laughs> Well, I think you're exactly right. Our Charter of Rights and Freedoms and the Bill of Rights that you know got we became part of it and all of that and then the American equivalents of those things are very deontological, right? right? They are very I mean they are rights I can't say they're very I mean mm. they are rights-based documents. They they say that um, at all costs under any circumstances as a nation we're committed to protecting these things. That doesn't sound like utilitarian language, right? I think the reason we are we'll stick to the Canadian context, the reason why we're 
ignoring these things now, pretending they don't exist is for exactly the, you know, the reasons you mentioned earlier about why so many people are of the utilitarian moral mindset. And if they are that, then they're also of the, on this kind of psychopathic spectrum mindset. And if that's where most people, whether they're academics or lay people or lawmakers or government officials, whoever, if that's where most people are, those rights-based documents are not going to appear to them to be useful. They will seem to be, Jeff, I think you mentioned like a relic of the past, dusty, right? Why would we... And I suspect a number of people who don't talk about them anymore um, do so because they really feel those documents need mm. to be reworked or done away with altogether, that those are not um, appropriate foundations of a democracy. And here we have the mm -hmm. fight, right? This is the fight between, um, you know, what does it mean to be in a democracy? Some people feel like it means to live by a constitution like the one we have in Canada, the Charter of Rights and Freedoms or whatever. And other people feel like that's not what it is to live in a democracy, to live in a democracy is to sacrifice yourself for the group. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And right. there's our debate. Jeff, right? can I just sneak in one more quick thing? Because I just want to link back to something that we said earlier. Um, right. uh, right. And uh, I think, Julie, you mentioned the nudge, right? In the nudge unit. And uh, there's an interesting right. paper in Nature Human Behavior. Uh, it's titled Using Social and Behavioral Sciences to Support COVID-19 Pandemic Response. And it essentially details... Uh, the different techniques that can be used, essentially psychological oh, techniques that can be used to uh, or leveraged in order to advance um, the desires of, of those who are in, in, in control of this whole thing. Um, and one of the things that they talk mm -hmm. about is um, this issue of uh, utilitarianism and, and deontological thinking. And uh, they write the following. Um, who is perceived to make those decisions? And it's about like, for instance, if you're running out of life-saving resources, who gets those resources, okay? So who is perceived to make those decisions may also impact the public's and patients' trust. In experiments, people who make utilitarian judgments about matters of life and death are less trusted. So this is, this is what reminded me because Jeff mentioned that. Um, Americans' trust in medical doctors remains high, and compared to public health officials, doctors are less utilitarian in their ethical decision-making, opting instead for deontic do no harm do no harm rules as such it may be best to have decisions i don't know if... <laughs> i was going to say i don't know if you can have deontic do no harm rules but anyway okay. yeah. <laughs> go ahead uh, <laughs> oh, okay so as such it may be best to have decisions behind life for life trade offs perceived as systematic and coming from governmental agencies rather than from physicians themselves and so that's the end of the quote. And so what they're doing basically mm -hmm. saying, you know, we think of physicians, they may actually have an interest of their particular patient in mind, uh, but politicians are, are supposed that. to be more utilitarian. Yeah. So we're going to, we're going to put the words in the mouth of the politicians and maybe even the decisions in the, in the hands of the politicians. And it's very interesting that that's, or, that's kind of been understood and worked out and it's now recommended to be done this mm -hmm. way. So, so it just, I just, it touches back onto this whole idea of the yeah. nudge, right? And using psych, social psychological principles to actually guide the response. Yeah, and it ties back to what we were saying about, you know, conspicuous medicine. And I think a lot of this was insidious to begin with. I mean, like, when did we shift from not trusting politicians to trusting them implicitly? When did that happen? Was it just 2020? <laughs> <laughs> because I think for the whole history of the human race, we've been much more distrusting of politicians, right? Um, maybe with a few blips here and there, I don't know. But you know what I mean? Generally speaking, politicians have not had a great reputation for trustworthiness. I mean, if you think about the, like the era of Clinton, Monica Lewinsky, and all of that, I mean, there was, you know, it's complicated debate. But um I think people generally ranged from either uh, distrusting him for showing a poor character and therefore you can't believe anything else, he says, or being wholly unsurprised that a politician would do something like this, right? I mean, politicians have not normally been seen as paradigms of moral virtue. We have had some great ones in the past and people look, you know, great speeches about freedom and all of that. But um, going into 2020, I'm not sure I would say that Canadian politicians were thought to be more trustworthy than anyone mm -hmm. else. And 
And now, yeah, now I think this kind of insidious subconscious um, belief a lot of people had that it's okay for medical issues and discussions to move into the public sphere is now just vigorously defended, Mm -hmm. right? Clearly our governments know what's best for us. And individual doctors are just being chastised, punished, lambasted. Um, You know, we saw Christine Elliott talking about how, you know, she's basically urging, which I think is putting it mildly, the CPSO to discipline doctors who don't fall in line and do exactly what the government wants, right? It should be the other way around, shouldn't it? That doctors give advice to, well, not even the government. They should be giving advice to their own patients and the government should stay out of it, in my view. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. That's just me. That This is, what, you know, you asked earlier, well, how did you become you know, the poster child for anti-vaccine mandates? Well, this is why, because I say crazy, controversial <laughs> things, right? People will say, did you hear what Julie Panessi said the other day? This crazy idea that the state shouldn't be involved in our medical choices. Get her out of here. That's why. (laughs) That's because Julie is fringe. I just want to advertise this shirt. Look at this. Yeah, totally. I am the fringe on the fringe. (laughs) fringe, She's a fringe too, yeah. (laughs) Well, we're we're at pretty much an hour and we don't want to keep you we don't want to keep you much longer. So this might that might be a good that might be a good note to end on. I don't think we can do better than that. So is there anything (laughs) that you want to uh, put the word out about? Is there anything you're working on? Any any events or podcasts or books or anything like that you want to plug? Yeah. Well, can I talk about Ottawa for for a minute? Because I think it really is kind of the, oh, yeah, there's the book. (laughs) Yeah, excellent (laughs) book. Oh, and you even have tabs on it. You you even mentioned Ash and you mentioned Milgram. We'll put put a plug in for our, our we we did two episodes, one on Milgram, one on Ash. So you mentioned Milgram, you mentioned Ash. So it's a good tie. Well, it's not irrelevant. People might hear that and say, "Why is she talking about Ash and Milgram?" Well, it's because I think we, um, I have said in the book and elsewhere that I think we have our you know our true pandemic now is a pandemic of coercion and compliance and um, the psychology. I mean, I you guys are the psychologists, but the the psychology, as I understand it, behind why and how humans comply and how it, how it's possible to break that compliance is just very interesting and very relevant to what's going on now, I think. What I wanted to say about Ottawa is um, if you try to book a room there right now, it's almost impossible. You would think the reason for that is because so many people are flooding to the city because they want to go and support or see the convoy. Well, if you, um, people who I know who are staying in the hotels now, say the hotels are empty, parking lots are half full. Hmm. Yeah, you're looking at me skeptically. I'm not skeptical, um, I was curious, that's an odd, yeah, that's. It is an odd thing. Um, what it's going to do most likely is deter people from going, right? Because it will be hard to stay there. Uh, I do think that with the problems we have with the media right now and a blackout of this particular event. Uh, if, you know, as a Canadian, you're really interested in, in seeing for yourself and not taking the word of anybody else, but if you want to see for yourself what's going on there, I really encourage you to do that. Um, I also encourage you to, if you're there, take film, take footage and share it because what's going on there is not what's being portrayed. And if you can get yourself there in any way, I think what's going to require people um, staying in the periphery of the city. There's still some hotels available in Gatineau or, uh, you know, within an hour of the city. You can drive in, park, and walk in about six blocks. It's still possible. So I would just encourage people not to be too um, dissuade, you know, um, put off if you can't get a hotel in the core. So well, that's great. That's some great advice. Yeah, I'm thinking of going. But thanks, guys. Lots of you should go. It's fantastic. If yeah. you see a truck pull up and a load of those sweaters, you know it's going to be Dr. That's Smelik. right. Dan That's is there. That's right. It's Daniel. <laughs> <laughs> okay. All well, right. Th- thanks so much, Julie. It was very nice to meet you. Absolutely. You guys have a good Indeed, day. Indeed, it was wonderful. Thank you. <laughs>